It is somehow perfect choice that in one of our books, in one of the books of our Bible, in the only biblical book that is assigned to be read in its entirety on this, the holiest day of the, our year, it is ironically perfect that the smartest characters in that book, the most intelligent ones, aren't Jews. No, the Jews in that book, the Jew, Jonah, comes off on first read as a shlemiel. Or is he a shlemazel? I sometimes have trouble getting those, keeping those straight. If one measure of intelligence is the quality of the questions that an individual asks, then the smartest people in the book of Jonah are the sailors. In Hebrew, hamalachim, a word that can be translated as old salts. The old salts, hamalachim, ask good questions in the midst of a storm in which they suddenly find themselves trapped. Like foreign characters in Hollywood movies who speak the Queen's English, the sailors' voices cut through the noise of the swirling winds with their good questions posed in perfect yet accented Hebrew to the Jewish foreigner on their ship. May I in Tavo, where do you come from? Emise Amata, who are your people? Mazotasita, what have you done? Ma Malachtacha, what is your work? These are elemental questions posed by old salts struggling with a boat on the verge of breaking up, a boat bound for Tarshish. Here's an aside, a little practical wisdom gleaned from the story of Jonah. Never, ever get on a boat bound for Tarshish. In the Bible, bad stuff always happens on boats going to Tarshish. When Jonah boards this boat bound for Tarshish, a knowledgeable biblical audience would recognize that everything is going to head south that God's going to get all biblical on him. Ships going to Tarshish sail through other biblical texts, and they never reach their destination. They're shattered by the east wind and sink into the heart of the seas with their precious cargoes. But the sailors don't know that. They haven't read our books. They aren't Jews. And like all characters, like every one of us, the sailors do not yet know the end of their story. So instead, in the midst of a storm, they seek salvation and search for solutions to their predicament. Enacting the adage, pray as if everything depends upon God, act as if everything depends upon you, each sailor prays to his God as they throw things overboard in order to lighten the ship. But though the men rode hard to reach dry land, v'yach teruha anashim lahashiv el hayabasha, they could not, below Yacholu, for the sea was growing more and more stormy around them. Meanwhile, the Shlemiel is fast asleep in the hold of the foundering vessel. I see him there in the bowels of the ship, his back against the ribs of a wooden hull, his head hanging between slumped shoulders, wrists resting upon his knees. He is exhausted unaware of the storm that rages and those intelligent sailors rowing desperately for the shore. But then the captain of the ship comes down into the hold, roughly shakes Jonah by the shoulders and growls, Malachad near Dom, what are you doing, sleeper? I feel bad for Jonah and for his story, stowed in the hold of the high holy days, placed gingerly in a crate labeled, only to be read on Yom Kippur afternoon. And that's what we do. We scrape off a year's worth of barnacles and seagrass, pry open a text, and then we reduce a masterpiece to the mildewed message of the perils of covenantal disobedience and the need for repentance. So I feel bad for his story and for Jonah, because like all of us in our stories, he and his are much more sophisticated than that a life story filled with perplexing meanings, slippery and elusive, 
like soap bubbles bursting just beyond the grasp of small children. His is a story lanced with absurdities that unfolds in a strange counterintuitive world, a world wherein an Israelite runs from God, yet a foreign empire in response to a five-word oracle turns towards God and repents, wherein God's chesed, God's loyalty, kindness, or love is described as a curse, wherein a supposed prophet is swallowed by a big fish only to be vomited up on the shore. Like we, Jonah lives in a topsy-turvy world comprising reversals, overturnings, and no simple resolutions to quandaries. His, like ours, is a story of change with meanings bracingly fluid. It can be exhausting having that as your story, so we can empathize with Jonah trying to figure it all out. And that's why, in a complex story filled with questions that ends with the question, the only biblical book that ends with a question, I like the sailor's elemental questions. Where do you come from? Who are your people? What have you done? What is your work? These are good questions, perfect for this day of remembrance, this day of Teshuvah, and this hour of Yizkor. Ten days ago, to the growl of the shofar rousing us from our sleep, we set off on our boat, rowing into a sea of transgression, sin, repentance, prayer, forgiveness, and righteous conduct, And last night, as the tenth day of our rowing dawned, on a day that began with our symbolic death, many of us shrouded in tully tote, the wind picked up and the sea became choppy. Avera, mechila, tishuva, slicha, tzedaka. Like waves slapping against the hull, the rhythmic Hebrew and reduced rations on this day may have lulled you back to sleep. But what cuts through the noise of the tempest, with one or two hours left in our journey, are these elemental questions, smelling salts reviving us from our stupor. Where do you come from? What are your, who are your people? What have you done? What is your work? We, like sailors reaching the end of their journey, who, smelling land, turn their thoughts to what's next, what they'll do when they reach the shore, We, too, grow impatient with this hard effort and long for it to end. But it's not over yet. We have arrived at East Core. One last chance on this day to dig into your past and to remember your people and from where you have come. To turn and turn again what you have done in your life and then to recognize what is your work. What are you to do next after you get off of this boat? Once your belly is full, How will you enact all that you have learned during the past ten days? And to those of you who will rush out as soon as we have cast off from Yizkor, whatever are your good reasons, it feels to us who are left behind that you are abandoning ship. And I fear that you might be missing the point. I fear that we all might miss the point if we reduce this next part of our liturgy to an obligation or to mere communion with memory. His core means more than that. It's not sufficient simply to remember. The memories of our people, of our loved ones, are to serve as a spur to action and to personal growth. And as we cast off from his core, we will say, Zichronam levracha, may their memory bring, bring blessing. But who do you think brings those blessings if not us? How do memories of our loved ones bring blessing, if not by our our incorporating their righteousness, their chesed, into our own? On our ship, it is not sufficient simply to remember. In the midst of a storm, the men rowed hard to return to dry land. The word for rowing, chatar, also means to dig. When you row, you dig into the water with your oars, 
When you row a boat, you face from where you have come. So wake up, sleepers. Dig deep into the past. Pull on its meanings. And by rowing together, we will reach dry land.